whether you like President Trump or you don't like him, he saw this as important enough to sign an executive order to look into. And I think it tilts the needle a little bit in favor of this is a viable threat to the nation. Uh, we can talk about why he did this or not. There's a lot of theories out there, but uh, at least it, to me, it tilts it more towards the idea that this is something we should really consider and worry about. Reluctant Preppers provides educational awareness and commentary only. Opinions expressed do not constitute personalized financial advice. Viewers are encouraged to do their own research and seek qualified personal financial consultation before making investment decisions. As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. You've often asked for this guest. Dr. Arthur T. Bradley is also a NASA scientist and engineer. He's an EMP expert. He's here with us to talk to us about questions that you've submitted about EMPs and to discuss a rather provocative article that came out about President Trump's executive order about EMPs, which I've never seen the likes of before. But before we get into that, I wanted to welcome you, Dr. Bradley, again, back to joining us here on Reluctant Preppers. Sure. Thanks for having me on. When I reached out to you because I wanted you to come in and weigh in on this uh, article that, that uh, we uh, shared with you, uh, you mentioned that uh, you were on your way back from a preppers convention, and can you tell us what that was about and where it was? Sure. It was uh, the Heritage Life Skills event. It's held every year down in Waynesville, North Carolina. First year I went down there, uh, every other year they've invited me. I've just never quite made it for one reason or another, but um, really good group of folks. Um, they had me as the keynote speaker to talk about EMP preparedness, so directly related to what we're talking about tonight. Well, maybe you can give us a clue tonight what your, your key takeaway message was that you delivered to them there, um, since we weren't able to see you in person. But uh, I wanted you to get you a chance to, to weigh in on an article that uh, came out just in the past week about President Trump's executive order on coordinating national resilience to electromagnetic pulses. It seems like we've come quite a ways. It's interesting as preparedness-minded folks. Uh, some people say, no, that's just common sense. It's the way people have been uh, traditionally dealing with uh, uh, self-sufficiency skills for generations and generations and upon generations. It's only the last century or so where people really forgot a lot of those skills or didn't hand them down and become over-reliant on you know, modern, uh, modern conveniences. And this is just a reclaiming of our heritage. Other people say, oh my gosh, People that call themselves preppers, even think about that stuff, are out on a fringe. They're kind of half, uh, you know, crazy or, or exaggerating or seeing, uh, seeing conspiracies behind every tree and under every stone. Mm -hmm. But when you have the, the government of the United States issuing uh, an executive order talking about how states need to have some uh, proof of resilience or utilities have to provide that, uh, prove that they're taking actions to prepare for what they would do in the, in the event of an EMP, it kind of makes you wonder... If this is becoming mainstream, is it something that perhaps more people uh, should pay attention to than have been? Yeah, there has been a lot of discussion, oh, I guess over the last few years, and there's sort of two camps. There's one camp that says, you know, an EMP is a grave threat to our national infrastructures that could kill millions of people by its essentially the effects of disrupting our, our the, all of the systems that we depend on, right? Water and food and electricity and everything else. And then there's the other side that says, you know, oh, this is just a hoax and there's no such thing as an EMP. And even if there was, it wouldn't have any real significant effect. And it, there's always sort of been a strong division between those two camps and intelligent people on both sides, I will say. I don't think anybody with any knowledge of the subject would deny that an EMP exists. I mean, that certainly they've demonstrated EMPs with nuclear warheads before, uh, all the way back into the 60s. But the question was, what effect, if any, would it have on the, the country? And of course, you know, we had an EMP commission report out on that um, it's been more than 10 years ago. And they essentially said that there would be grave impacts to our national infrastructures and that we should do something about it. We, we as a nation should come together and figure out what our, our vulnerabilities are and take some steps to mitigate those impacts. And I don't know, you know, in the government how that was received. Um, there's strong supporters of things like that, like Newt Gingrich, for example. But by and large, a lot of people felt like it maybe fell on deaf ears and that not a lot of action was taken, certainly not visible action. And so it is encouraging uh, whether you like President Trump or you don't like him. He saw this as important enough to sign an executive order to look into. And I think it 
tilts the needle a little bit in favor of this is a viable threat to the nation. Uh, we can talk about why he did this or not. There's a lot of theories out there, but uh, at least it, to me, it tilts it more towards the idea that this is something we should really consider and worry about. Yeah, it's uh, pretty interesting language um, in the order, uh, such as it is the policy of the United States to prepare for the effects of EMP through targeted approaches that coordinate whole of government activities to encourage private sector engagement. The federal government must provide warning of an impending EMP, protect against, respond to, and recover from the effects of an EMP through public and private engagement, planning, investment, and so on. Um, mm -hmm. What are some of the reasons you think that this is being brought forward at this time in particular? Well, I've heard different theories. Um, you know, there's been a big push by some of the people uh, that were on the original EMP commission, Dr. Peter Pry is one of them I've met, but there's retired admirals and other folks who, even over these years, have continued to press, you know, to have this looked at. And they were always kind of behind the scenes. I've spoken with a few of them. And one theory is that they finally were heard, right? You have a different leadership. And this certainly seems like a very serious and grave threat. And so maybe finally it fell on some ears that people decided to take some action. That's one theory. The other theory, and I don't have any basis to support it, is that the nation as a whole saw some kind of perhaps impending threat in this area. Um, certainly there was talk of this with North Korea when we were, you know, hot and heavy and sort of a showdown with them at the time. There was a lot of discussion about EMP. And I know North Korea has made gestures along that. Uh, so has Russia. They've made open threats about EMP attacks on the U.S. So it could be that, you know, those in high places got an inkling that this is a possibility and this could be coming sooner than we might would think and decided that it's time to take some action to get ready for it. Hmm. Um, some of the provisions of the order um, put put uh, expectations on different parties. Uh, are there any things in there that that got that caught your eye as far as any uh, government agencies or utility companies or or uh, local uh, organizations or anything that you thought wow I you know they kind of um, grabbed your attention as that you might not have expected to see in such a uh, in such a uh, order. Yeah, there were a lot of different names tossed about and agencies in there that were sort of going to be given one role or another. Um, it did seem like there was a, going to be an emphasis in having private sector involved, which is probably a good thing because our, you know, our utilities are owned and managed by many of them by private sector groups. Yeah. And so I think there's some, the idea of putting some of the onus on these private sectors, maybe through some tax initiatives and incentives and things to get them to make some improvements to these infrastructure items. And I think that's probably a good way to do it rather than the government trying to come in and manage and do all that ourselves. And uh, I guess turning our attention to um, your recent uh, keynote speech at the Preppers Convention uh, that you just returned from, uh, could you give us a hint of what some of the, the key takeaways are that you left with the audience there? Sure. Yeah. So. I had a whole uh, day and a half with them really there. It was pretty interesting. I taught a couple of classes on EMP preparedness and building Faraday cages, which was pretty neat. Um, one time I'll have to have you on, or I'll have, come on your show and I'll talk about building Faraday cages and all the lessons we've learned. But uh -huh. they got to see firsthand, they built their own Faraday cages in this class. And then I brought test equipment so we could actually measure how effective the Faraday cages were. And it was pretty neat. You couldn't look at two cages and really tell which was going to be better, but it was always based around the seams on the lid. And, and, you know, we would talk about it ahead of time. Yeah. Everybody was very thrilled to get their Faraday cages just right, you know, in the end. So I thought it was pretty successful. Uh, at the end of the night, I gave a little speech just on general preparedness and, you know, in particular, sort of how you might ready yourself, your family sort of to address some of the threats from an EMP. Now, these was a, this was a group of, you know, hardcore preppers. These guys knew about food and water and those sorts of things. What they were more interested in is, like how do you protect maybe your home from a large conducted pulse that might come in from an EMP? So we talked about the EMP storm, the product that I'm developing. We talked about protecting your car, perhaps by covering it with a conductive cover. Um, and so we went through some of those basic preparation, building Faraday cages and that sort of thing, just to sort of really target um, the preparedness towards this one particular threat. How long was the conference overall and, and how much of that was um, devoted to your keynote speech or some of these workshops that you mentioned? Yeah, the Heritage Life Skills event really is like a learning. I, I encourage anyone to go. It's really like a learning workshop where for two and a half days they have just class after class after class. There's usually like five going on at a time. So you have to take your pick which ones you want to attend. Everything from soap making to 
you know, EMPs to firearm tactics. There's just all kinds of things, right? So it's really neat to go to. There's a lot of interesting people you meet, as you'd imagine. Um, if you're, so if, if you're a couple, you can split up and cover at least two out of those five yeah, sessions at a time. Yeah, you could. Yeah, you sure could. And then there's a lot of famous authors come that write in the survivalist genre. And so, I, you know, I knew some of them, but I got to meet a whole bunch of those guys. Um, a lot of solar power companies, there's a couple of those come usually, and they show off their wares because there's a lot of interest in that too. But it, mostly it's a learning opportunity. It's a lot of classes. I say I taught two classes that were each an hour and a half. And then the, the speech at the end of the night was another hour. But everybody was busy doing something the whole for the whole two and a half days. Yeah, sounds fascinating. Um, we have uh, quite a few viewers' uh, questions that have been submitted for you. If we could pick a few of those and then give you a chance to tell us about progress on your product that you're developing uh, for whole house EMP protection at the end. Um, this one, it gets back to the Faraday cage question. We've, there's many of those, but I'll just try to pick a few. This one okay. from Peter Wilson asks, does a broken microwave oven work as a Faraday cage? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it works pretty well. I tested one for my book, The Disaster Preparedness for EMP Attacks book. And, you know, it provided, I would say, acceptable uh, shielding. I think it was along the order of between 40 and maybe down to about 25 dB across frequency. So that's you know, in terms of percentage, that's like between 90 and and 99 percent, or or something like that, which is which is good shielding. That means it's a, doing a decent job. I typically advise that to have a, a really solid, effective Faraday cage, you want about 50 dB of shielding total. So if you use the microwave oven, you might want to put things inside of maybe a Faraday bag or you know one of these EMP bags before you put it in there, just so you'd have two layers of protection. Uh, when you mentioned Faraday bags, these are conductive, uh, like Mylar bags with a conductive uh, coating. Um, I think they're available on your website as well if people want they to are. check in them there. Okay. Yeah, um, they're available on the website or other places you can get them. Mm -hmm. Since we were talking about that executive order, Bob Miller asks, can the U.S. electrical grid be retrofitted to survive an EMP attack? I think there are some steps that could be taken to allow it to survive. Um, there's been talk about having like, uh, modes in which the grid is switched down or switched into a low power mode to make it less susceptible to an EMP. Now, what safety mechanisms there are and how to protect those large transformers, I'm not entirely sure. You'd have to study that technology. But you have to open the path, essentially, for that, that high ground current that's going to flow up through those transformers and damage them. You'd have to somehow open that path. And I, there's ways to do it. It's not beyond our abilities. But it would probably require some pretty significant investment to do that. This there is, is one other thing I'll point out Go ahead. just while I'm thinking about it. Um, you know, there's also this solar coronal mass ejection threat, right, which we've talked about before, which is very similar to the E3 of an EMP. The, and, and so the same protections to the grid would be required. The difficulty is that for, in, for a coronal mass ejection, we might not have very much warning. Mm. Well, we might not for an EMP either, but yeah, right. the so, solar coronal mass ejection, we might only have minutes or maybe up to an hour warning. Even though we knew that the, the plasma was coming our way, we wouldn't necessarily know its effect on the Earth until maybe a very short time before the event actually started disturbing our power grid. So it's a, it's a difficult thing. You have to be ready for it. Wow. Uh, Domo asks a question that a lot of people have asked, and that is what, you know, the, the nature of a lot of these questions is around what good does it do to make uh, personal specific point protections of devices that you have inside a, a Faraday cage or whatever if overall systemic um, resources are, are going to be damaged. So he asks, is there any point in trying to protect your car, radio, or phone from an EMP if EMPs would also destroy electrical systems that pump the fuel radio stations or cell phone towers, or are the electrical pumping stations, radio stations, and cell towers protected from EMPs? No, nothing's really protected per se. All, all of those things would be susceptible. And and I hear that question a lot, which is, you know, why protect my car if, if everybody else's cars are down? There's no gas stations and things, right? And same way with electrical power. Why protect my home if the grid's going to be down? But the extent of the damage is not known. Right. And so we don't know if the entire grid will go out, if it will be in a black, a rolling blackout sort of a thing. Um, we don't know if, for example, even if the grid is out where I live, if I have the ability to generate backup power, I could still provide power to my home for a period of time, maybe to allow me to get through it, especially if I have solar power. So there's there's always mitigations and strategies for sort of, you know, surviving and, and moving ahead the next day. The more options you have, the better off you are. And I'm a firm believer of that. If I have a car and I have enough gas to get out of town or to get four or five hundred miles away, it gives me an option that maybe other people might not have. Mm -hmm. About 
a third of our questions are all on, around this following topic, and you can probably guess what that is. Our emergency night nurse asks, will my solar panels be reduced to expensive solar shades, or can I shield or replace my controller inverter and still use them? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it is true from my understanding, and I, I know of a company who has tested solar power generation systems, and they were indeed damaged by an EMP. Uh, especially when the system is all connected together as the way it would be on your home. So it's certainly possible that an EMP would damage a solar power generation system, uh, maybe your panels, maybe your inverter, maybe your charge controller, your batteries, right? Any, any or all pieces in that system could be damaged. So there's a strategy. I don't think there's a like a, a one shot I'm going to hook. I thought at one time I was going to invent just the device, right? Um, that I would hook to my any solar power generation system and it would just protect it. Uh -huh. Similar in the way to the EMP storm is meant to protect the home. But it's a different threat. Um, it's a radiated threat on all of the pieces of the, the distributed solar power generation. So I don't think that's solvable by a device, a single device. Instead, I think it's a, a multi-part sort of process that you need to do to harden your system. And I've started work on that listing of what you have to do. It's about 10 items. There's about 10 steps you have to take to harden a solar power generation system. And I get my list all together, I'll come back down again, we'll talk about them and go through that list and tell people how they can harden their solar power generation system. Um, this follow-up question that you've, that you've answered before, if a nuclear reactor does melt down because of an EMP, how far away would be a safe distance uh, if I lived east of the reactor or downwind? Yeah, that's a tough question. Um, you know, it depends on how it's contained. If it explodes, if you end up with a, an explosion and you release radioactive particles into the air, you know, they're, they're going to be taken airborne and they can go certainly tens of miles, maybe even 100 miles or more. Um, so I don't know how to answer that explicitly. If you didn't have an explosion, then things are much more near, near range that the concerns would be. But once you have explosions into the air, you know, things can go a great distance. Just like in the Fukushima event, things went across the ocean, right? We had we measured noticeable fallout uh, in California, so mm. you can get it a long distance. Not deadly fallout, but noticeable, measurable fallout. So, this is another recurring uh, vein of questions that many people have asked, and that's about protecting vehicles. Will all vehicles be disabled? Uh, sorry, this is Mountain Girl who asked this. And will a vehicle be safe if it's parked in a garage and shut off? Um, so the short answer is nobody knows for certain. Um, the testing that's been done on vehicles was inconclusive. They didn't really do an exhaustive testing on, on vehicles for EMP uh, susceptibility. But most people believe that many cars would survive but would just experience an anomaly. So if you're driving along and an EMP happened overhead, the car might go haywire for a little while. But if you shut it off and restarted it, it might come back up and you could get home, assuming the roadways were passable. Um, but, but again, some percentage of cars would be permanently damaged, and nobody knows what percentage that is, whether that's 10% or 40%, uh, there's a lot of people that guess different things, but it's unlikely to be 100% and it's unlikely to be zero. So the bigger problem would probably be that if you can imagine two out of every three cars on the road all of a sudden experiencing an anomaly at the same time, there'd be car crashes all over the place and the roads would be just packed and there wouldn't really be, it wouldn't be a priority to clear those roads because of all of the other infrastructure impacts. And so it, that, I think that would be the bigger problem, uh, more so than not having the ability to have a car. It would be that there, you couldn't really get very far, and also you wouldn't have fuel very quickly. Another person uh, with a, uh, another Faraday cage question, Wayne Guy asks, could a deep chest freezer sealed with metal tape be protection against an EMP? Sure. Yeah, anything that's conductive, like a, a freezer or a filing cabinet or a gun safe, all of those can be used as a, as a good shielding system. And you can make them a Faraday cage essentially by fully sealing them up in one way or another. Now, as the lesson that the students at that convention learned is, it's not the holes in the in the enclosure that matter so much, right? I've mentioned this before. You can you can drill small holes in your Faraday cage, and it doesn't affect it greatly. But as soon as you have long seams that are left, you know, with a small gap, even if you can't see the gap, a small gap, then it really compromises your Faraday cage. So if you had that freezer, for example. You'd really want to pay attention to the lid and how it's sealed with the top of the of the freezer. That would be the most important thing. So, if you could uh, take us into the discussion for an update of your 
uh, whole house EMP protection. We had you on when that was just a twinkle in your eye. We had you on for a mid project update and now um, we'd like to know how close you are to availability of those devices and, and if you have any initial uh, test results yet that you can share that kind of thing. Sure. Yeah, so I, I had it sitting handy here so that I could show it. Um, this is it. This is the EMP storm. This is actually one of the prototypes. Um, and so just to, just to review, this is a type two surge protection device that's meant to mount beside the breaker panel inside your garage or wherever that happens to be. And the idea of it is to protect against the conducted pulse that would come down the power lines if there was an EMP or a solar coronal mass ejection. Either one's gonna send a really big transient on the power lines, which is gonna damage pretty much anything plugged in at the time. So like many other surge protectors, it's also meant to protect against things like a nearby lightning strike or load shedding, things that we normally have problems with in our homes. Um, so just as a, as a quick summary, the, the difference of it is from a conventional surge protector is it has three different stages of protection in it. One, each stage is matched to one part of the EMP. So there's a, a stage one, which matches to E1, a stage two, which matches to E2, and stage three matches E3, where each of those stages is targeting a different aspect of the EMP waveform and, and trying to attenuate it or prevent it from reaching the house. All right, so the way it does that on the E1 uh, pulse that comes in is it tries to soften that pulse and spread it out in time a little bit, uh, which makes it easier to, to clip off. In the second, the E2, as it comes into the house, it really limits the maximum voltage that can be applied to the house. It just clips it off and drains that energy away. And that's very similar to a conventional surge protector. And then the E3, which is really kind of unique, as far as I know, there's no other surge protector that I'm aware of that has this type of protection. But when an E3 comes in, it's a long duration pulse. It might last a minute, maybe an hour. Nobody really knows. And it could be from a solar event or it could be from an EMP. And once that long duration pulse is present on the house power lines, it really kind of damages things in a sort of a long, slow, steady fashion. And so what the EMP storm does is it, it looks for that long duration pulse. And when it sees that it's present, it pulls a great deal of current and trips the breakers in the, the breaker panel. The idea being that if I can disconnect the home from the power lines, then the home would be uh, kept safe. And so that's a unique feature. I'm not sure that other surge protectors do that. I've never heard of one. So anyway, it's a unique sort of system that's protected. Now, in terms of progress, um, I have made quite a bit of progress, uh, built prototypes and sent uh, prototypes up to an independent lab in the Chicago area, which tested them for, against three mil standards. I wanted to pass three, the three different conducted mil standards under 461, mil standard 461G, which is the most current one. And one of the standards is essentially for rapid transients, really fast transients, kind of like an E1 of an EMP, except not nearly as big, I will say. And then the second one, um, the CS116, is the for damp sinusoids. This occurs uh, oftentimes during uh, like switching outside of uh, loads on your power lines and those sorts of things. And surge protectors really need to be able to survive and provide protection from those. And then finally, the third one is against nearby lightning strikes. So that mill standard test to see, can you, can you handle like numerous bursts that would be presented from a nearby lightning strike? And it's really a neat test to, to study. But so those three, the product went through no problem at all. One unit passed all three tests, one consecutively after the other. And so that was great, a little expensive, but uh, it's done and it's a one-time deal. So the next big hurdle is to get through uh, underwriter labs testing for safety and effectiveness. And that's a very difficult test. Um, for one thing, their, their job is to destroy the device, many devices, like 30 of them, in every which way they can, right? So you have to build up a bunch of them and send them to them. And they scrub every component to see if it's certified and approved. Is the board manufacturer approved? Are the spaces between the parts enough? You know, everything is very carefully looked at for safety. Uh, and then they start shooting big bolts of energy into it to see if they can catch it on fire under any circumstances. And once they do everything they can to destroy it, if you pass their test, then you get the honor of paying them some more money where they can stick, you can stick a logo on the box saying <laughs> it's certified. And it's just incredibly expensive. Um, and that's if nothing goes wrong. If anything goes wrong, then you got to repeat parts of it. And so I just signed today uh, to get that testing initiated. So, you know, say some prayers for me that in the next couple of months, I have good fortune with that testing. So. Once that's done, though, it's essentially I'm free to, to sell it to the public. It would be authorized to be sold. Um, some companies do sell products that are not tested, by the way, but it just 
a dangerous thing to do and it's silly. So I'm going through this testing and then once it's approved, I'll build, the plan was to build 500 units and uh, distribute those 500 units to people who pre-ordered. Uh, we'll say almost all of the pre-orders have been placed. I think we're at 470 something ordered. So it's very close to those 500 being pre-ordered. Well, we have to give you credit for your persistence at pressing through not only the uh, physical uh, and electrical challenges, but all of this uh, uh, regulatory and uh, underwriting red tape that it takes to really go through all this testing. It's quite a, quite an ordeal, but uh, thanks on behalf of everybody who's going to benefit from that for, for sure. sticking that yeah. out. <laughs> I just hope it all comes to fruitful you know, ending here, but we'll see. If people want to get involved and find out more, where can they find you? Yeah, so on the EMP Storm, they can just go to empstorm.com, and there's a whole bunch of information. There's about 10 videos I've put on there now, and it also talks about EMP preparedness a little bit on that. Um, so that's probably the easiest place to, to go and look. And like I said, there's still a few units you can pre-order if people are interested in them. We've been talking with Dr. Arthur T. Bradley, EMP expert, and uh, fielding not only viewers' questions, but weighing in on some major news. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bradley, for joining us again this time on Reluctant Preppers. Sure, thanks for having me on. With surprising new concerns expressed about Dunnigan's changing hairstyle, one viewer even commented, that hair is dyed, fried, and laid to the side. But what you're not being told is Dunnigan's hair needs no dye thanks to the wonderful vitamin and mineral regimen that Melody recommends, and is not laid to the side to cover any bald spot either since Dunnigan's full head of hair is exceptionally well attached. However, Dunnigan does use hair products only as a disaster prevention because he's at severe risk of catastrophic emergency situations. But although there may be some changes you don't like to hair, this is one kind of change you'll definitely want to have on hand if the situation gets hairy. Pure silver! And for a limited time, your first ounce of silver can be purchased at spot price with free shipping on orders over $99 by going to sdbullion.com slash rp and you'll be supporting reluctant preppers as well it's within your grasp to get your hands on the perfect change for hairy situations at sdbullion.com slash rp p.s donnegan was not harmed in the making of this video hey reluctant preppers if you haven't heard we've already started our monthly one ounce u.s silver eagle thank you gift to one active patreon subscriber each month signed by your host donnegan kaiser and you don't want to miss out on that Please help us grow by subscribing today at patreon.com slash reluctantpreppers.